So, regional skew. So, just a second ago, we were talking about priors that had to do with quantiles, quantile priors. And this is prior distributions for parameters. So, they're both called priors, but um, I want you to notice the difference in the terms because it has to do with how it's used actually in the calculations. Um, so, in this presentation, we're going to talk about some sources of regional skew information. Probably many of you are familiar with this type of data already. Uh, we're going to describe how regional skew relates to the prior distribution of skew, and we're going to talk about how to enter that data into RMC Best Fit. So, let's talk by discussing the skew parameter of the LP3 distribution, which measures the asymmetry of the distribution. So, remember back to your college class um, that a log normal distribution has a zero skew and plots as a straight line on a log normal probability plot, which you can kind of see is that light blue dashed line. A positive skew produces an upward curvature as the long upper tail reaches higher vertically on the right, and a positively skewed LP3 is bounded below, which is the lower left of this plot. The negative skew, on the other hand, produces a downward curvature. You can think of it as a frowny face. And it produces, um, or sorry, the longer tail reaches downward on the left. And the short upper tail pulls downward on the right. So you can think of it as the negative uh, skew is bounded above. So if you imagine that center um, straight line being the bound, then you can see that it, it doesn't get any higher than that. So it's bounded above. Okay. Because at site records are relatively short, the skew parameter has large uncertainty. In fact, it has much more than the mean or the standard deviation for a data set. It's the most, um, the most uncertain of all the three parameters. In this example, you can see how long it takes for an at site skew estimate to stabilize at a value that is approaching the true skew value. So this is an example that was done using a data set where we knew the true skew, and then um, we used software to estimate that skew. And you can see that um, it ranged all over the place, um, and it took a long time. It's not even shown on this. Even in 500 years of record length, it doesn't even converge to the true value. So that's why um, this is a really important parameter in our flow frequency analysis because small changes in our record can really make a big difference. And we might think that the, the distribution is actually one way and then we get another piece of data, either a low flow or a really high flow, and that can drastically change our skew. So um, it's kind of an important parameter. Um, for, you'll notice here for record lengths that were less than 100 years, the skew estimate, well actually this is just true in general, not just in this in this graphic, but for record lengths that are less than 100 years, skew estimates can change rapidly and dramatically because it's very sensitive to extreme events, especially when we're talking about short record lengths. Since systematic record lengths are never long enough in practice, because we only have as long as we have records, um, we'll need other sources of information to help us um, improve our at-site estimates. Um, and so that is why we use regional skew um, information. So here's another example that can kind of help you visualize the benefits of using regional skew information. So in this example, we can see how much the skew estimate can vary given a record length of only 50 years. The at-site skew estimates, which by the way are the blue circles, um, could be just about any value between positive one and negative one. So you can see the skew on the vertical axis. Those blue points are all over the place. The true value is the orange solid line. So our at site data in 50 years, we, it's not really giving us a very good indication of what the true value of skew is for this, this basin. There's a large uncertainty. And since we can't just create more at site data, the issue can be mitigated to some extent by including regional skew information from a regional skew study. And these studies uh, provide information about the value of the skew for a site located in a particular region by trading space for time. You may have heard that expression before. In other words, we're using multiple sites in the region to extend the effective record and estimate a regional skew that can help try to make up for a little bit the short record length. Um, in this example, we can see that extending, excuse me, that including 
the regional skew information moves the outside skew estimates closer to the true value in each trial. So if you look at the graphic again, the blue points are the outside skew estimates in a 50 year record. The orange is the true value and then the gray triangles are the weighted skew. So you'll notice that every time we added regional skew to an at site estimate, the weighted value is actually closer to the true value than the blue dot was itself. So that's what, that's what this graphic is showing. So a recommended source of regional skew studies is the USGS website for flow frequency reports. And they are generally organized by state, so you can pretty quickly tell if there's a regional skew study for your state or not. And sometimes there are more than one. And it's important to use only published regional SKU estimates from recent SKU studies that are based on modern methods. Um, you may be familiar with the Bulletin 17B regional SKU map, and we would advise you not to use that um, in any study um, because those were using older methods and they're, they're just frankly not as good as this, the methods that we have today. So um, if please don't use the Bulletin 17B SKU map. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit in future slides about how to read a regional SKU report. Um, so it's really important to know how to locate that information in those pretty long, very detailed, um, heavily jargoned reports. But I'll give you some tips on how to do that. Um, you also need to be able to read the study to understand whether or not that SKU study is appropriate for your site. Because sometimes they look at certain types of watersheds and it might not line up with the watershed that you have and it might not be appropriate to use. So it's important to understand those differences. Um, generally speaking, the drainage area for your site should be like those included in the regional SKU study if you're gonna use it. For example, if the regional SKU study evaluated basins with drainage areas between 10 and 1,000 square miles, then your watershed should be within that range if you're gonna use that study. And it's important to understand, and probably you already know this, that regional SKU studies are commonly developed based on peak flow. And um, some of them are avail available for longer flood durations, and those can be used if available, but oftentimes they're not available. So the question comes up a lot, can we use this peak regional SKU for my basin if, that's, if my critical duration is anything other than instantaneous? So, and that's almost all the time, right? So. Um, Basically, here's some rules of thumb. Um, SKU estimates can typically be used for relatively short critical durations on the order of a few days. So if your critical duration is one, two, three days, you can feel pretty comfortable using a peak regional SKU study for those basins. They should not be used for longer durations. So for that basin I told you about earlier today that had a 66-day critical duration, probably not appropriate to use peak regional SKU for that type of a critical duration, just not even in the same universe. Um, in other words, a SKU estimate based on peak flow is not a good estimate for SKU estimates um, for longer durations. The federal guidelines for flood frequency analysis, Bulletin 17C, recommends that the regional SKU information from a regional SKU study should not be used when the difference between the at-site SKU and the regional SKU is greater than about 0 0.5. So that's another indicator about whether or not you should use the regional SKU study for your basin. A large difference between the at-site SKU and the regional SKU is an indication that the regional SKU information may not be applicable to your site. And of course, engineering judgment is required to decide whether or not to use the regional SKU estimate. So here on this slide, you can see there's a, um, there's a little graphic that gives you a pictorial um, definition of whether or not you should use regional SKU for your basin based on your critical duration. So if it's a one day, yep, you can use it as long as your basin fits the other characteristics of the study. If it's a three day, you're still within a pretty, a green, a green arrow. Um, as we get towards the seven day, kind of moving into the questionable range. So probably seven days is the outside limit of where you would want to use a peak regional SKU study. Um, you might still have some skeptics at seven days, between five and seven days um, that say, is this really applicable? Um, but that's the probably, I've discussed this at length with several experts at, uh, in the core at the HUC and the RMC. And this was the consensus, was that anything greater than seven days is a definite don't use it. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, 
Okay, so I mentioned that I would get to this and here it is. So here's a clip from a regional SKU study and it kind of looks a little bit like mumbo jumbo. There's a whole lot of weird symbols and acronyms and what does all that mean? It's definitely different from how it used to be in some of the earlier regional SKU studies in terms of how it's d denoted here. Um, so modern regional SKU studies typically evaluate multiple options and then adopt or recommend the most appropriate estimate of regional SKU, which is usually the method with the smallest mean square error and the largest pseudo R squared. Some studies recommend a constant value of regional SKU for an entire region and a value of regional SKU um, that's recommend, uh, so, and others recommend a value based on the ba some basin characteristic like elevation. So in California, um, that's often a characteristic that's used because it's, you know, elevation really impacts what the skew is like for different flow data sets. Um, a smaller mean square error means that the regional skew estimate contains more information about the value of skew. In other words, it gives us, it reduces our uncertainty more. You will generally want to look for a summary of the study in a table or in the report text. This example shows the results from two different regional SKU study reports. The regional SKU estimate might be referred to as a regression parameter. So there you can see regression parameter, and that is the regional SKU estimate. So that's what you'd want to use in your calculations. Um, it can also be described as a general SKU value. So you might see that in the, in the text, you can see that. Uh, the mean square error can be referred to as the average variance of prediction or AVP, or it can also be referred to as the mean square error. So you can see that in the text. So those are some key things to be looking for um, either in the chart or in the, in the actual narrative part um, so that you know that you're using the right number. Because a lot of times that's a, that's a little bit of a conundrum, <laughs> making sure that you get the right number. Okay. When we have regional SKU uh, information available, such as region, a regional SKU study, we can apply what is called a prior distribution. Prior distribution allows us to account for the regional SKU information in our frequency analysis. And the regional SKU estimate provides information about the value of SKU at our site before or prior to analyzing the at-site data. When we don't have regional SKU information being used, RMC Best Fit uses the default prior distribution for SKU that is flat, um, so you can, it, it's a little maybe hard to tell in this picture, but come back to this and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, you, you see that it says U parentheses negative two comma two. And then in the picture, it, on density, it says zero. And then there's a flat blue line there. So that's indicating that we don't have any regional skew information. We're using a flat uniform distribution for um, skew and it, basically is saying that the prior distribution could be anything. It could be any value of skew. So it's not informing our analysis. It's not adding to our knowledge about what's going on for the data set. Next, we'll look at how to modify the skew parameter distribution to incorporate regional skew. Okay, so if we want to incorporate a regional skew information, we click the distribution for skew to change the distribution, and we select normal from the drop-down menu. The uncertainty in regional skew estimate is typically assumed to be normally distributed. Then you're gonna enter the regional skew value from the study as the mean value in RMC best fit. You'll need to calculate the standard deviation. So that's where it gets a little tricky and you gotta really pay attention to make sure that you're doing, that you're using the correct numbers. So um, it's not that the math is any more difficult than, you know, it's basic division or and square roots and stuff like that, but you don't, um, Sometimes people forget to do this step. So you'll need to calculate the standard deviation as the square root of the mean square error from the regional skew study. And remember that the mean square error is equivalent to the variance for an unbiased estimator. So those of you who are lovers of statistics, th those words should help explain what's going on there. And then the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance. This normal prior distribution for the skew parameter provides prior information about the value of skew for our study. So you can see there that that top value, negative 0 0.17, we took that from the previous slide where that was like in the report. And then we took the square root of, uh, of the mean square error to get that 0 0.35 value that we put in the standard deviation box. And that created this normal distribution that you see in the blue. 
So it's no longer the flat uniform distribution. Now it looks like a normal distribution. So far, we've talked about prior distributions for skew parameters. Now we're going to discuss the, the posterior distribution of skew parameters. So remember when Alan was talking about how the Bayesian formula works, we've got our at site data, we have our prior information, and they get combined to create the posterior distribution. So posterior means after. Um, distribution, these posterior distributions are the result um, from a Bayesian estimation analysis. That's what we get after we do the calculation. So RMC Best Fit provides plots to visualize the prior and the posterior distributions for parameters such as histograms or kernel density plots. These plots show the marginal distribution of the parameter of interest. In this case, we're going to look at a plot of a posterior distribution for the skew parameter. Let's look at an example. The first thing we'll look at is the kernel density plot for an analysis with an at site data only or just station skew. And then we'll look at an analysis that uses, uses regional skew information. Once the Bayesian analysis is complete, you'll select the kernel density, and you can, I don't know if you saw it, a little red flashy line up there. It's one of the options in your menu that you can choose. And then it'll pull up this kernel density plot. From the drop-down list, you can select the parameter of interest, and here we've selected skew. So you can look at the mean standard deviation and skew, and we're choosing to look at skew right now because that's what we're talking about. This shows the posterior distribution of the skew parameter from the Bayesian analysis. And in this example, you can see that the skew generally fall between a range of negative one and positive 0 0.5. So on the, on the x-axis, we're going from negative one to plus 0.5. And then it kind of have a normally looking distribution there. When we check the show prior distribution checkbox, we can also show the prior density in blue. For this example, it's the default prior. So that means we're just using at site data. And you can see that the flat prior is just has a skew of anywhere from negative two to positive two. So, you know, just the whole range. The posterior mode for the skew in this example is about negative 0.4, since the prior distribution for skew is an uninformative flat prior. Um, and this estimate is basically the at site skew. So that's the important thing. If you're using a flat prior, you're just getting the at site skew. Now let's look at an example. Um, oh, so I'm gonna keep that example on the left there. That's the one we just looked at with the flat prior. Um, and now we're gonna look at one where we have uh, an actual regional skew piece of information that we've added to our analysis. Um, so we've, we've included the regional skew information as a prior distribution for the skew parameter, and the prior distribution is shown in blue. The posterior distribution, or the, the distribution that we get at the end of our analysis, is shown in red, and that is now the weighted skew. It's very similar to the weighted skew. So you should notice two things about the posterior distribution for skew shown in red. First, the estimate of skew moved towards the regional skew value in the plot on the right, when we actually added regional skew information. Um, so you can see that the weighted skew, now that we've added our weighted, our regional skew is now negative 0.29. So it's shifted because it, the at site skew is negative 0.4 and now the weighted skew is negative 0.29. And you can also notice that the width of the posterior distribution on the right is not as wide as the posterior distribution on the left which indicates that our uncertainty has been reduced because we have a tighter, we have a tighter range now. Um, that means that the regional skew information influenced the estimate of skew for our site and also reduced the uncertainty in our estimate of skew. These differences will be reflected in the frequency curves by a shift in the posterior mode curve and the posterior predictive curve, and we'll also see a reduction in the width of the credible interval. So here you go, here are some plots to look at. Um, so on, here's um, the graphical frequency curves comparing results with and without a regional skew um, piece of information such as a prior distribution on skew. You can see that the posterior mode skew statistics changed resulting in a normal shift to the left of the posterior mode frequency curve. The uncertainty is also reduced resulting in a shift to the right of the posterior predictive frequency curve and a reduction in the width of the credible interval. 
The reduction in the width of the confidence intervals can be seen by noting that the posterior predictive curve no longer crosses the upper credible interval. So this question comes up a lot. People will say, oh no, best fit must be doing something incorrectly because my, my posterior predictive curve is crossing the upper boundary. Well, that's not correct. I mean, it is correct. It's calculating it correctly. Um, what it indicates is that you need more information. And so notice that when we've added some regional skew information, it's brought those credible intervals a little bit more narrow and it's also shifted the posterior predictive curve closer to the median curve, um, or the, the mode in this case. Um, thus, we can see the, that incorporating regional skew information can improve our estimate and reduce uncertainty in our flood frequency analysis. Oh. Yep, there's some circles that show you what I was just talking about. 